Well, last night, I was up at a, with Colston at 11. I was up sick at 12, 1, 2, 3, and 5. And so I decided today that I'm going to preach the same way that I had a night off. I'm going to preach through Genesis 27, 28, 29, 30, and 31. Um, it's a story. Uh, I'm not going to cover any single verse. I'm going to tell you the story. You can read those chapters. Um, but I want to talk to you this morning about the touch that will change your life. Um, I believe that every single one of us are given the opportunity at some point in our life to say yes or no to Christ. It wouldn't be fair of God not to give us an opportunity. And in, uh, in Genesis, we have a character named Jacob. And Jacob's name meant surplanter or conniver or conniver. Conniver, conniver. Uh, even that, that's not a good word, is it? <laughs> He was he was he was a spoiled rotten mama's boy conniving self-centered uh, individual that only cared about himself and his his own agenda for his life. Um, we are the same way. We're born into this world, deceivers, sinners. The Bible says, "For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God," uh, and no amount of of infant baptism or church membership or going to church or 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 wearing the right clothes or doing all of that kind of stuff is going to get you into heaven. The Bible said, and Jesus plainly said out of his own mouth, you must be born again. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. And so we have Jacob who was growing up. He had a, he had a brother named Esau. And he was... Esau was, was the outdoorsman. Esau was the, uh, the hunter, the gatherer, the, the farmer, the, 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 the worker. Jacob was the spoiled rotten little mama's boy that wanted everything handed to him. and wanted everything given to him. That uh, he didn't want to have to work for anything. One, one example, I think it's back there in, in chapter 27 actually, is that Esau was out hunting and, and out working in the fields and he came back one day and he was he was just starving to death and Jacob had been sitting there eating uh, eating some soup that he had made and uh, and it must have been really good stuff. I mean, I mean Jacob must have been either a pretty good cook or mama had cooked it for him and was taking care of baby boy, which is probably the way it was anyway. And so Esau came in and he was just absolutely famished. And instead of his brother being a kind brother and sharing with his brother, he said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll sell you a bowl of it. Well, how much you want for it? Oh, how about your birthright? At that time in, in, in history, the oldest brother um, inherited most of the, the family possessions. Um, he got the blessing. He got the, the majority of the inheritance and things like that. And so Jacob figured out a way to get Esau's birthright for simply a bowl of soup. Um, that was the beginning of his deception, of his life of deceiving, of his, of his, of his and, and what I found out in my life, it's, it's a gradual process of evil. I was thinking about some of the things that led me to some of the things that I did in my life. Uh, and, it, and it starts out little. It starts out with one lie or one deception or one stealing or one reading something you shouldn't read or looking at something. And, and it starts out It starts out on a small scale and then it graduates and graduates. And pretty soon, it's kind of like quicksand. Any of you ever watched those old westerns where, where they go into the quicksand and they step into it and it's okay to begin with, but then they start trying to get out. And they sink deeper. And the harder they struggle to get out, the deeper they go. And it's, and it's the same way in our life. It's Jacob began a life of deception. And his whole life was, was wrapped around deceiving and conniving. 
even though there were times in his life when he made a commitment to God. I mean, there was one particular time where he was dreaming, he laid his head on a rock and he was dreaming and he saw the angels ascending and descending out of heaven and he, and he promised God. He promised God, if you'll be my God, if, if you'll go with me, if you'll bless me, then I'll follow you. And it was an empty promise, though. Yeah. The Bible says, I think it's in Ecclesiastes. I'm not positive. It might be Proverbs. I don't remember for sure. But it says, it's better not to make a promise than to make one and not keep it. And But Jacob was making promises to God. How many people have you heard about? Maybe you've even done it yourself. If you, God, if you'll get me out of this. I swear I'll start going to church or I'll, I'll start giving my money to the or, or God, if you'll just, God, if you'll just fix this situation for me. God, if you'll just, God, God, you know, I, my heart's good, God. You, you know, I really love you, God. And then you get out of the situation and you forget about all those promises you made to God. That was the way Jacob was. His whole life, Genesis 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, all the way through. That was the way his whole life was. And every single one of us are that way in our lives. We come into this world. The Bible says that we come into this world speaking lies. And, and, and so even these young, innocent young men up here, and, and you parents know they ain't innocent young men, but I'm the pastor, so I don't know them as that kind of people. They're all sweet, angelic little cherubs to me. Amen, they are. Yeah. <laughs> but they have a tendency. They have the potential. They have the uh, genetics turn into something that's not quite so angelic. Um, and every one of us have that. Every, every single one of us have the potential to be evil. Uh, it's whether we exercise that or not. But Jacob exercised his. It came on a little while later that him and his mama got together and, and they, they tried to figure out a, a way to actually steal the inheritance from Esau. And, and, and then what they did is, is she said, I'll tell you what you do. She said, you go into your daddy because he's almost blind. And you pretend to be your brother. And Jacob, you know, he had half a brain in his head. He said, but mama, he said, Esau's hairy. I'm smooth. She said, got you covered, dude. Go out to the flock. Get you a sheep. Skin that sucker. Make you a big old pot of stew out of it. But save the hair. Instead of just tossing the hide aside this time, go ahead and cook the big pot of soup. And we'll take that into daddy. But when you when you when you get the hide off the sheep this time, bring it to the house. And she said, I'm gonna make you some sleeves. That boy was that was a boy was a hairy man, I'm telling you. He looked like some of y'all. <laughs> but but he, she made, him, she made him some sleeves and stuff. So he goes into his blind daddy, laying on his deathbed, and he pretends to be. He says, you know, you, 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 sound like, you sound like Jacob, though. Oh, no, daddy, feel my arms. I'm, I'm Esau. And so he felt him with hairy arms. <laughs> and he went, well, you know, you, you, must, you must be. You, you, you sound like Jacob. But you just you, you feel like Esau. Well, 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 bless me then, Daddy. Give me my blessing. I know you're on your way out of here, real compassionate kind of guy, you know. Daddy, I know you're getting ready to die, so bless me before you take your last breath. You know, yeah, give me give me the keys to your tool trailer before you die, Daddy. <laughs> where, where do you keep your John Deere tracker keys? Didn't I ask for my truck to see Cause was telling me the other day. Papa, when you die, your truck is mine. <laughs> I hope I kind of outlived my truck there, buddy. I don't know. But, you know, it's, it's, he said, he went in and he said, bless me. And so with that, with that, now remember, Jacob has been that way all of his life. One deception after another. And then he tricked his daddy into giving him the birthright. And Esau found out about it. And man, he was ticked. And he made a vow. He said, if it's the last thing I do, I'm going to be an orphan because I'm killing that sucker. I'm getting rid of Jacob once and for all. Mama found out about it. You know how your mamas are? You little whiny baby boys. Run, Jacob, run. Go, and go, go, go to Uncle Laban's house. Hang out with him until Esau's anger is subsided. 
What she didn't know is that Esau wasn't planning on his anger of subsiding ever. But he took off and he went and worked for Laban, his uncle. And so then he, he fell in love with one of, one of Laban's daughters. And he made a deal again. Here he goes making deals. I'll work for you for seven years for that girl that looks so fine. Laban said, cool. See that, that genetical stuff, that, that generational sin? Laban had a part of that too. And he said, no problem, dude. You go ahead and work for me. So seven years, Jacob's getting excited. Man, he gone in and took him a bath, combed his hair, went into the tent, woke up the next morning, and it wasn't Rachel who was there. And he said, whoa, 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 whoa what you doing here? <laughs> I went to Laban. He said, you put the wrong girl in my tent last night. Oh, well, it ain't right for, for a younger girl to go get married off first. I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, you work for me for seven more years and we'll make it right. And he finally, after 14 years, he got his wife that he'd been working for. And then he decided, yeah, I understand. Some of these guys are going, not a chance. <laughs> and then he said, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. But, but for seven more years, we can figure out some, some deals on what you've been working for for the last 14. And then, after all of this time and all of this deception and all of these making deals back and forth with God, God still loved him. And no matter what you've done or how big a deceiver you've been or how big a sinner you've been, God still loves you. Yeah. And he wants to use you and he wants to bless you and he wants to help you. There's something that's got to take place though. And that's that touch that changes your life. Yeah. And Jacob decided he was going to go back home. And he was going to face Esau. And he was going to pay back all of the stuff that he had stolen from him. He was going to just empty his heart out to him. But he was terrified. Now, bear in mind, though, he's still a conniver. That's what he did. He's got over there in the woods. And he took his wives and his kids and all of his possessions. And he sent them ahead of him to Esau. And he sent him all kinds of presents with him. And the man is smart. There you go. And then in the middle of the night, look at verse chapter 32, verse number 24. See, I, see how it didn't, took, didn't take me very long to get all the way up to chapter 32. I know some of you are relieved. But chapter 32, verse number 24, it says, And Jacob was left alone, and there wrestled with the man. There's going to come a time in yours and my life when it's just going to be you and God. And it's decision time. And notice that, that wrestling with a man. You see, that to me pictures or typifies our battle between good and evil, our battle between God and our own selfish individual selves. And, and that, was the, that was the thing. Jacob Jacob was wrestling. He had left alone all of his possessions he had sent forward to try to make amends and try to try to do what's right another time in his life. Because there were times when he did try to do what was right for a little while. And, and, I'm, and, and, and in, in yours and my life, we can try to do what's right for a little while. But ultimately, we're going to fail without him. You, you can't, I mean, that's why so many New Year's resolutions fail. That's why so many diets fail. That's why so many attempts to quit habits fail. That's why all, because we're trying to do it on our own, in our own strength. And we, we're, I mean, we're like, what, 75% water. We're, we're nothing. And so Jacob is left there, and he says he wrestled with a man until the breaking of the day. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him. You see, God is not going to force you into surrendering to him. I mean, this is God that he's wrestling with. This is a theophany. This is the angel of this is this is the, 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 the angel of the Lord. This is this is Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that he's battling with back and forth. And yours and my battle every single day of our life is against our flesh. It's between God and us. 
And we battle. Some of you may battle against Copenhagen. Some of you might battle against porn. Some of you might battle against a bad attitude, unforgiveness, a bitter spirit. Whatever it is that you and I battle against, because we all have our battles. Don't think your battle is any worse than anybody else's. You're no bigger sinner than anybody else. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. Jesus died for us as sinners. And I don't care whether you've told one white lie in your life or if you're like me, you've made up so many lies you don't even know what the truth is anymore. And so Jacob is there and he's battling back and forth against God. And, and, and at any second, God could have took his life. At any second. But you think about it, he's wrestled with him all night long. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Neither one. I remember when me and Waylon used to arm wrestle. And we'd sit there for hours pushing against each other because we were about of equal strength. And neither one of us could win against the other. We beat everybody else in high school, but we couldn't beat each other. And and and, and we and, and Jesus and Jesus and Jacob, Jesus and Jacob, Jesus and Jacob, Jesus and Jacob. And it's today, you and me against Jake, Jesus, you and me and Jesus, you and me and Jesus, you and me and Jesus. And the Bible says that Jesus prevailed not against him. Jesus is not going to make you trust him. Jesus is not going to make you follow him. But there is a touch that's going to change your life. And if you'll notice what happens next, he touched him in the hollow of his thigh. He was wrestling with him all night long. Come here, Ty. Hurry, 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 hurry. I'm getting old. I know you're getting old, but come on up here anyway. I know you've been working all morning. It's all right. Now, there was a time I used to hold him in my left hand and work on my computer. Now, I don't really know if I'd want to go up against him anymore. Oh, you got me all I know. That's only because you love me, though. I mean, he could probably pick me up and tote me away and fold me up like a pretzel anymore. And so we could go at it for a while. And eventually, when he got tired of wrestling me, he probably just said, okay, Papa, we're done with you. Oh, man, this thing. <laughs> Talk me aside. <laughs> but it was, it was like Jesus just walked over to him. Just, just said, we're here. Now, they've been wrestling all night long. And, and the Bible said that the angel of the Lord, wow, <laughs> the angel of the Lord couldn't prevail against him. But then the angel of the Lord reaches over and touches him right there. Boom. And, and, and it me. The touch of Jesus will change your life. That's so true. The touch, just one touch, one touch from Jesus can change your life. And, 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 and from that day forward, the Bible says that it wouldn't need the sinew of that particular leg, that wouldn't need the muscle of that leg, because of the symbolism of that touch. And, and Jacob walked into that area, prideful, self centered. Self-dependent, could handle anything on his own. He had connived his way to make it right with a brother who had screwed out of life. He had screwed Jet Laban out of 90% of the flock. He, he, I mean, he was he was a self-sufficient, self-made man. And one touch, yeah. he started walking differently. Right. One touch from Jesus would change your life. And when he saw it prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go. I ain't gonna let, ain't gonna let you go till I bless you. What's your name? He ain't telling you your name. All of it went on. And God had already been preparing Esau's heart. Because if you read the rest of the story, Esau said, I, You were forgiven a long time ago, dude. I don't need your stuff. God bless me. And, and, and I'm not going to say that everything you screwed up in your life will be ironed out. But God fixes an awful lot of stuff. I know he's fixed an awful lot of stuff in my life. He's fixed my relationship with my family, with my kids, with my dad. You know, it's one touch. One touch to change your life. I ask you this morning, have you had that touch? I know you've been wrestling against Jesus. I know you've, you, you've, been, you've been hanging on to maybe your old religion, your old ways, your old habits, your old stuff, your old way of life, who you are, 
who you've been, who you want to be. But have you ever had that touch that changed your life? From the youngest one up here to the oldest one back there. Have you ever been touched? In the New Testament, there was a guy that Jesus was healing, and he touched his eyes. He said, what do you see? He said, I see men tree. And he touched him again. But one touch will change your life. That second touch will fix your life. But all it takes is one touch from Jesus. Oh, you won't be perfect. Jacob still had problems, but he was never the same. As a matter of fact, he was so not the same that Jesus even changed his name. And it's because of him we have the nation of Israel. Because Jesus said, I know what you've been. I know what you've done. And it's okay. It's under the blood. Because my touch can cleanse you all. The Bible says he cleanses us from all iniquity. Not the parts that me and you hang on to. We might hang on to it, but with Jesus, it's gone. I know I know some of you sitting here this morning that you're in the middle of that wrestling match. You're in the middle of that wrestling match of giving up you and turning it over to him. The Bible says that my spirit will not always strive with man. Don't let it be your last chance. Don't let it be your last chance. If God is dealing on your heart, deal with it. Maybe it's a surrender of something in your life. Maybe it's a surrender of a way of life. Maybe it's just you surrendering who you are and becoming who he wants you to be. But one touch, one touch can change your life. And Jesus is waiting to touch you. The Bible says about Jesus when he was physically here on this earth, that everywhere he went, everybody he touched was changed. Let Jesus touch you today.